Todd Bowles spoke with the media at the NFL meetings in Arizona, and that means you can put all hopes of a Lamar Jackson trade to bed. That and more on this episode of Locked on Bucks. Your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to the Locked On Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are your daily podcast covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Please subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So you always get the latest episodes when they drop. I am James Jarko, Deputy Editor of SB Nation's BucksNation.com, joined by my esteemed Wednesday co-host, Mr. Evan Klosky of 10 Tampa Bay. Of course, you can check everything he is doing out over on 10 Tampa Bay at 10 Tampa Bay dot com. Follow everything on Twitter at Locked on Bucks at Jarko underscore Bucks and at E Klosky W T S P. Evan gives you his biggest winners and losers. Buccaneers after this first wave of free agency. But first, Todd Bowles spoke at the meetings in Arizona on Tuesday. Lots of things were said. Talked about shedding money. Talked about kickers. Talked about his uh, sunny disposition now that he's in sunny Florida instead of cold, rainy, wet, snowy New York. Um, And one of the things that he talked about was Robert Hainsey. And Todd Bowles said, quote, I thought Robert Hainsey came a long way. When Jensen went down, I think that goes very underrated with the job he did. He can play guard as well. I was very pleased with everything he did. End quote. So you can read from this what you want. Todd Bowles was impressed by Hainsey. Todd Bowles knows that Robert Hainsey can play guard. The way I interpret this is Robert Hainsey is going to be a starting guard for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You can talk about how they're could have potentially been some competition uh, with, you know, you have Aaron Stinney coming back. You had Nick Leverett step in and he played really well. You have Robert Hainsey, who's a center, but also a guard. You you could have thrown around some competition. I flat out, I think Robert Hainsey is a locked and loaded starter at guard for the Buccaneers this season. What are your thoughts on this, Mr. Klosky? Yeah, I don't know if it's locked and loaded, but I have a tough time believing that Robert Hainsey isn't going to win whatever job is given to him with him going for the guard positions, obviously, while still backing up Ryan Jensen at center. And who knows what you know his, his leg is going to be like ever since that injury. But having said that, he played a position he really never played before, was learning it on the fly. He did have an entire training camp to get that figured out, but he also worked with maybe the most um, idiosyncratic quarterback of, of all time with the mechanisms and the things that he wants from you. And, um, you know, in the end, he got playing experience for an entire season. So that should bode well for him entering the off season, continuing to work with AQ Shipley, who, you know, uh, if he if he's not having enough fun on the Pat McAfee show, would make a, a phenomenal coach in the National Football League one day. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, he's got great tutelage, and he's going to have tremendous battles with Leverett and Stinney and Gedicky. We think is going to be a a, a, a right tackle if you swing over Tristan Wirfs, but. Who knows what the NFL draft is going to do and right. if someone's going to slide into that other tackle position and then all of a sudden you have Gedeke in the mix there. I mean, truly their offensive line for how bad it was last year, despite whatever numbers you want to throw at me because we all know Tom Brady was able to fling the football in two, two seconds. But there's a lot of good depth and mm-hmm. when injuries naturally do happen on the offensive line, Outside of Tristan Wirfs, who is irreplaceable, they're going to be okay, I think. You know, and I, I mean, I, I would imagine Stinney's going to 
have to work himself up after that tough injury last year so he he should just be depth and good depth come the middle of the season i i I think yeah it'll be interesting to see stinney's timeline and and when he is actually able to be a full return to the field but of course even once he returns to the field there is going to be that process of getting back to being 100 percent football shape and and things of that nature yeah like he's not chris godwin right you're not like that's right you don't need to rush him out to the field so well, yeah, and then, of course, even with rushing Godwin out to the field, there was still some some rust and, and some issues. that That's what I'm talking up. about. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You it, know it, I mean? I'm sure Godwin would have loved to have taken another month to fully get himself feeling like himself and right. then had, you know, it would have been still rust, but at least he would have probably felt a little bit better. But, um, you know, we saw Godwin. It, t- it took a while to get those engines revved up again. You know what helps an offensive line that is having some trouble blocking? a super mobile quarterback like Lamar Jackson, who Todd Bowles was asked about at these meetings. And uh, Bowles, of course, you can't say too much, right? The the guy is, I mean, is it considered tampering when he's been tagged but hasn't signed the tag? I, I don't know. That's a whole different conversation. But Todd Bowles said, quote, he's a heck of a player. I hate playing against him. He talked about how the Bucks are shedding a lot of money And uh, as one outlet so kindly put it, Todd Bowles never used the word no. We did have a caller, Kendall, out in California that uh, left a voicemail. Now we're still having trouble getting the audio from voicemails onto shows. But essentially, Kendall called in and said that NFL.com has the Buccaneers as a top five landing spot for Lamar Jackson and wanted to know, is it? Still a possibility that the Buccaneers pull off a trade since Lamar requested one back on March 2nd. I mean, it still goes back to everything we talked about maybe a a couple of episodes ago. Mm -hmm. Is it a move that the Glazers would push? Absolutely, knowing their history of kind of swinging for the fences. Having said that, it, it does seem like everything we hear from the team is about being fiscally responsible into the future. And they simply do not have the money for a Lamar Jackson. I also think they want to truly use 2023 to fit all of these young guys are, for the most part. This is a great, they think they're going to be competitive because they're the ones that drafted a lot of these guys and are invested in these guys. You know, it's like, your, your kids, you're not going to be like, oh, man, they suck, right? You're going to give them every ounce of the benefit of the doubt before you realize, okay, uh, maybe maybe this isn't the spot for them. Not now moving out of the kid analogy. They're always, <laughs> they're always in the family, whether they stink at sports or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we'll, <laughs> you know, we'll see how that hockey career goes, right? That's um, right. <laughs> but, but ultimately, the, the money – I mean, for them to bring in Lamar is just a huge pain in the tush to figure out how to make that money work this year. And then going further down the line, I I think if Lamar was able to kind of play under the tag this year with Baltimore, I think next year we would have a lot more to talk about and really go through the what ifs, but they would not only have to trade a couple of first rounders, which is an easy decision, to be honest, they would also need to trade a couple of significant players to get them off the books. And you're probably talking about someone who would help Lamar, uh, like like a Mike Evans or a Chris Godwin, and on top of maybe getting rid of a Shaq Barrett. I mean, you're, you're, you're you know, you it's, it's complicated. So I just, um, I think it's very easy for the Bucks to play the money line and say, yeah, it's a money thing. It's a money thing. A lot of other teams don't really have that out, but the Buccaneers do. I'm sure they're doing their due diligence. I just would never get your hopes up. It makes sense on black and white paper, but when you have to do the logistics and from everything we've heard, it just, I really do think that the Buccaneers want to try to see what 2023 is going to be and figure out a lot of answers with their players, which will dictate movements uh, in 2024 and beyond. And again, if they do stink, there are two premier quarterback options coming out next year 
that being Caleb Williams and, uh, and, and Drake may. So I think if you stunk it up this year, there, there is a, at least something that you can fall back on and say, you know, Caleb Williams is unequivocally a game changer at the next level. I, I truly believe that I couldn't be more, uh, more high on, on Caleb Williams as an NFL quarterback. Yeah. And I, I know that I spent a lot of time a couple of weeks ago making my pitch for why it would make sense for the Buccaneers to make an offer for Lamar, give up the two first rounds. And I don't know. It was like 12 hours after that episode. Yeah, you public. mushed it. Uh, you know, Baker Mayfield had, had agreed to terms and look, I, I think at that point, as soon as Baker was the Bucks guy, it was because they couldn't figure out how to get the money to work to the point that Baltimore wouldn't match. Um, so I was like, you know what? They might be playing the long game on this one. They might be saying, let Lamar play for a year under this tag. Let him become a free agent next year when we have 70 some million dollars in cap space. And we can make it work, and and we can bring Lamar to Tampa. The fact that Lamar is demanding a trade now that he will not play under that franchise tag, it it it's going to be impossible to get it to work. Like you mentioned, you're probably having to get rid of a Shaq Barrett. You you might be trading away right because you know that's a guy who is on the the fifth year option of his contract. He's going to cost a lot of money. You're probably shedding that too. It's just the the logistics of it. It's not impossible, but I would say it, it's as likely as uh, me going out to dinner and a movie with Carrie Underwood this weekend. So thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Evan is going to take a crack at naming his biggest winner and loser from the first wave of free agency for the Buccaneers. That is coming up next on Locked On a Box, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Day. The tournament is heating up, and there is no better place to get in on the action than America's number one sports book. That's because right now, FanDuel is giving new customers a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's one up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just go to fanduel.com slash locked on and sign up today to claim your no sweat first bet. Then you can wager on everything from the money line to point spreads to which team will be cutting down the net. The two Florida teams, Miami at 450 and Florida Atlantic at plus 550, are the two longest odds remaining. All of this on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. So don't miss your shot at a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up, make every moment more with FanDuel. Thank you again for making Locked On Bucks your first listen or view every single day. David and I broke down our biggest winners for the Buccaneers after the first wave of free agency last week. And then David broke down the biggest losers on yesterday's episode. And so, Evan... David and I talked about Rashad White being a winner, uh, Levante David being a winner, Baker Mayfield being a winner. On the flip side, you had guys like Mike Evans and Antoine Winfield Jr. that we put in the loser category um, because of all that has transpired so far in a free agency. So I'm curious what your thoughts are as to who benefits and who does not for the Buccaneers, and let's start with let's start with the negative. Let's let's take this on an upswing. Let's start with the bad, work our way up to the good, and uh, and get everybody in a better mood by the time we're talking about some um, some signings coming up in just a little bit. So let's start with your biggest loser for the Buccaneers in free agency so far. Yeah, my um, one of my biggest losers is uh, Vita Vea because. The man needs some help up there in the front. If you've listened to any WTSP Wednesdays, you know that I keep harping on the defensive line and the inability to really put pressure on the quarterbacks. Vita Vea led the team in sacks last year. If we can just make Vea worry about stuffing the run and getting some internal pressure and have some other dudes on the outside, you know, they're getting so much help by the fact that you have to eat up a couple of people with Vea, you know, even somebody next to Vea 
you know, we see rumors that maybe Akeem Hicks is, is floated, uh, could, could float his way back to Tampa Bay. Mm-hmm. You know, there was another signing yesterday that I know we're going to talk about soon, uh, which is just a depth piece. But simply put, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, unless Logan Hall is going to break out, what which is what we're kind of hearing from Jason Light and Todd Bowles, though I, I, I think it's a little bit of hope mixed in there with – with the uh, the anticipation, similarly, they talked about Joe Tryon Shanka that way, and we saw flashes, not necessarily the consistency. So, yeah, they, they just uh, they haven't done enough up on the defensive front, and that still, to me, is the most glaring weakness of all with this team, despite having Vita Vea there. Yeah, uh, and he every time we we start to talk about. Um, you know, Vita Vea and the defensive line. All I can think of is the the really, really old Kevin Hart stand-up where he's just standing there, help me. Uh, that, that's all I can think of. And and Todd Bowles did speak about how they bring back Akeem Hicks. That is a guy that they are still hoping that they can have return to the team. But he doesn't solve everything either. You, you still need help. And, and we've talked about on numerous Mock Draft Mondays, having to get you know a 3-4 defensive end to line up opposite of a Vita Vea. You can get those guys that that eat up those blocks and and can free the the edge guys and, and can free up Levante or or Devin or the safeties to come in and get pressure on the quarterback. And Vita Vea is not going to lead the team in sacks, but I think it was a, a combination of circumstance. It, it was a combination of unfortunate bounces for the Buccaneers and their injury issues and and all of that. But Logan Hall wasn't cutting it. Uh, we know Joe Tryon, Shoyinka, this is kind of a, you know, make it or break it season for him. Um, yeah, and and the signing that we're going to speak about, you're you're 100% right. It's it's pretty much depth. That's what you're looking at. So, yeah, I uh, I agree with that that assessment. Vita Vea not, uh, not benefiting very much from the Bucs' uh, first – uh, wave of of free agency. Maybe, maybe they're saying Venus help for the draft. Uh, that is coming up much much faster than uh, than I was anticipating. It seems like as you get about a month away from the draft, that clock starts to speed up a little bit more each and every day. But let's talk about something a little more positive. Let's talk about your biggest winner for the Buccaneers following that first wave of free agency. Yeah, my biggest winner is going to be Zion McCollum because thank oh. you, Jamel Dean, for coming to town. <laughs> now I don't have all the pressure on myself to perform. You know, he gets Jamel and Carlton, which this is kind of it's funny because it really is kind of like a win and a lose. I get ping pong it, but you get two great veterans who mm-hmm. you can continue to learn from. Uh, you should be limited in the amount of pressure you have to perform. You're pretty much at this point next in line to step into playing time when one of them inevitably gets hurt. Cough, cough, Carlton Davis, because he always gets hurt every season. Shot so here. you're going to get playing time. It's going to be like this year all over again, just hopefully a healthy training camp. So if you remove Jamel Dean and let's say – didn't replace anybody with him heading into the draft. I mean, it'd be a pretty dicey situation for a lot of us talking about that, that cornerback spot, but I think Zion McCollum is properly supported again. And whether he's a thing or not is, is I don't know. I, I, I don't know if he's good enough, you know, but I certainly am not going to write him off because the game was too fast for him last year. I just I thought there were a lot of things working against him, uh, especially that dark cloud that was over the team in general, but mostly not not being able to perform for half a training camp bleeding into the first couple of weeks of the season. So, um, yeah, I, I think Zion and us not having to focus in on him like many did on Donovan Smith is a positive. He doesn't have to deal with – uh, all that pressure right out of the gates. Yeah, and and I would say it's it's also a win for Zion that Sean Murphy Bunting 
goes to Tennessee. The Buccaneers couldn't get anything worked out with him. So now he has an opportunity to, I won't say start in the slot, but he has an opportunity to compete for that job. We're going to assume that the Buccaneers address the cornerback position in the draft. So he's going to have, you know, competition there. He's going to have competition from, you know, other, you know, other guys on the roster, guys from the practice squad, guys that have come, come in and out. Uh, D Delaney is probably going to be in the mix there. So it gives him the opportunity and, and something that I continue to believe and everyone's entitled to their opinion, but I truly believe that after quarterback corner back is the toughest position to transition to from college to the NFL. So you have kind of that, that learning year for Zion McCollum getting used to the NFL game. You have the, the learning curve of learning a Todd Bowles defense, which is incredibly complicated and incredibly difficult. And some of these veterans, it, it took them almost, you know, a full season to be able to grasp that concept. We didn't see the, the big jumps from some of these guys in the secondary until Bowles' second year with the team when, you know, the Bucs went on to win a Super Bowl. Wasn't uh, bad. Wasn't bad. So you're looking for a, a big step in growth from Zion McCollum. He has the intelligence. He has the athletic ability. He has the size. He has the, the work ethic. But you need to see that jump, and it, it's not going to be handed to him. So, yeah, I, I actually really like that pick that, you know, this could end up being a win for Zion. They picked him for a reason. And uh, we're going to see if if he has what it takes to fill Sean Murphy Bunting's role as that uh, as that slot corner. So a couple of moves that the Bucks did make makes you question if they made the right decision or not at a pretty pivotal position that they have not had a whole lot of luck with. That is coming up next here on Locked on Bucks. Wrapping things up here on a WTSP Wednesday edition of the Locked On Bucks podcast. James Jerko, Evan Klosky, and the Buccaneers did sign defensive lineman Deidre Sinat to a one-year vet minimum deal, giving the Buccaneers some needed depth along the defensive line. But they also signed the Ryan Suckup replacement. Ryan Suckup released last week by the team to save that moolah. And Chase McLaughlin, McLaugh, McLaughlin, Mc uh, Sarah McLaughlin. Yes. Chase McLaughlin. I think. McLaughlin. Okay. So I we think. don't have to, uh, be very concerned about, you know, the, the abandoned puppies, uh, when talking about this kicker, but he is joining the Buccaneers, uh, 26 years old. He played last year with the Indianapolis Colts going 30 for 36, uh, on his field goal attempts, including nine of 12 from 50 plus. He was a perfect 21 for 21 on his extra points, but this is his fifth year in the league and the Buccaneers will be his seventh team for his career. He is 78.8% on field goals, 97.8% on extra points and 17 for 21 from 50 plus. So the dude has a leg. Uh, however, suck up in his three years in Tampa had an 84.8% field goal uh, percentage and 93.6% uh, on extra points. Flip side, two for seven from 50 plus. So is this an upgrade and locked in starter or is this just the beginning of a kicker competition to go along with the quarterback competition in training camp? Uh, I think this seems like the starter. I know that he's bounced around. He really, the first handful of years, didn't have a, a full season type role with a team that, that seems to have just perked up the last couple of years. And I mean, not. And a 12 from 50 is pretty impressive. Yeah, you like Ryan, that. Ryan Sucka didn't hit nine field goals from beyond 50 yards when you add up his past six seasons combined. So that is what we're dealing with here. You are exchanging a little bit of certainty for 
the deep ball, but, but that's fine. I, we do it in baseball all the time, right? We, you know, we don't really worry about the, the copious amounts of singles as long as you hit us to home runs. So I think that with Ryan suck up, uh, you have to take a little bit of risk here with kicker because as much as I love Ryan within 50, it was very clear how detrimental, you know, that's the thing. When you miss a 50 yard field goal, I count that as a turnover. So that to me is, you know, when Ryan Sucker goes to, to a seven, those are five turnovers because you're giving the other team tremendous field position on top of the missed field goal. So I like it. Um, we'll see how he does kicking. I know they mentioned in Phoenix how he expects a lot out of the kicker. He, you know, he said, we're in Tampa. We have warm weather. There should be no, ex-, he didn't say it in these words, but it, essentially that there should be no excuse to not have a, a good kicker in Tampa. You have great conditions all season long, at least at home. So I, um, I- I'm for it. Yeah, I'm down. I'm down for that. Yeah, and I, I mean, taking a look at at his his numbers and his numerous stops. I mean, seventy eight point eight percent, you know, on his field goals. It, it's obviously it, it seems like a big downgrade compared to what Suckup did. But this is a guy that for his career has only attempted eighty five field goals. Mm-hmm. So you know, you had you had percentages like. 83.3%, 87.5%. He had uh you know he was 80% uh for for Jacksonville in 2020. The the big bugaboo was when he was with the Los Angeles Chargers in 2019, 66.7%. He went 6 for 9. Uh and then with Cleveland in 2021, he was 15 of 21 for 71.4%. Other than that, the dude is kicking over 80%, which is pretty much what you want to see with longs of, of 50, 52, 57, 54. So I like it too. You know, you you may not be quite as automatic, but again, Ryan Suckup had a lot more opportunity than uh than McLaughlin has in you know in his career. So I think it overall it's a it's a pretty solid move. Now Spot Track had his Estimated market value at four point one million per year. I sincerely doubt the Buccaneers cut Ryan Suck up and then spent double the money, essentially on uh, on a new kicker. I'll be interested to see when those contract details do emerge. I will say Mike Greenberg has been uh, messing around with these void years. Oh yeah, Levante Mike. David, one year for seven years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Greg Gaines also yeah. has like four void years. So you know they're. They're cleaning up the books, but they're doing it responsibly because, again, it's not that you need to have no void years in the future. So you just got to get through. You know, you can't be sixty million over the cap, and the money's going to go up here soon. So a lot of this other money is going to be eaten up by what the the raise will be, and these are, these are fairly minuscule amounts anyway. So, but you got to you got to be able to bring people in too. So. You weren't right. you weren't going to be able to just flip all of the system since you need to build a roster. You just gave all of the Lamar Jackson people hope again that they're. Uh, they're yeah, yeah, there's there's a little bit of difference between Greg Gaines uh, and his. Uh, I mean, yeah, you mentioned it. It's not impossible to figure no. out something for Lamar, but I mean, it's going to be hell to figure it out too. Well, that's why they get paid the big bucks, and we get. You know, the opportunity to uh, tell them if they did well or they did poorly. And I'm uh, surprised you're not, a you, you know, at least with Chase. Uh, I don't even know if you should be talking about him because you're biased due to his alma mater. Oh, is he an Ohio State guy? No, Illinois. Oh, Illinois. Oh, well, shoot. Uh, well, so he, he great signing, for- great signing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he kicked for them during the dark ages, which is pretty much most of Illinois football, but you know what that means? That just, he's the first of at least two Illinois players that are going to join the box this year. Uh, hashtag draft Sydney Brown. Some bad news though. Pour one out for your boy. If I had taps on, uh, on my soundboard, I would play it right now. Uh, another alma mater that I'm rather fond of, it is my sister's alma mater. Uh, it is one of the places my son has picked out that he would like to play hockey for if given the opportunity. 
the Bowling Green State University legend, Scotty Miller, has signed a deal to go play for the division rival Atlanta Falcons. Uh, it was a fun ride, Scotty. Enjoyed uh, enjoyed the NFC Championship. Enjoyed the uh, the speed and the the deep balls that Tom Brady was able to take advantage of with you on the field. I enjoyed our conversations uh, in person. Uh, why the Falcons? Why is everybody going to the NFC South, Evan? It's a little annoying at this point. Look, love Scotty. Love everything he did for this franchise. Will go down in history with one of the most momentous plays in franchise history. I mean, you know, you think Rondé Barber is probably at the top, but but Scotty Miller is is not far behind Barber's interception in, in Philadelphia. It just when you think of that that Super Bowl run, that's the first play that comes to your mind. But is it really that big of a game for Atlanta? You know, the I mean, he really didn't do much for the Bucks last year when they desperately needed speed and help, and they still couldn't find a way for him to get on the field and and be a consistent threat. So he had that tremendous performance in the two minute drill of the Rams comeback. I believe it was the Rams or the Saints, but I think the Rams won. But, yeah, oh yeah, it was uh, it was Scotty and Kate Otten during yeah. that that Rams game. Yeah, so I mean, we love Scotty. I, I don't think that. Anybody in Tampa, as, as far as fans are concerned, should be shaking in their space booties because he's, you know, with the team. It's just going to be nice to see him twice a year. Honestly, it's going to be nice for the players to see him more than, uh, you know, I don't know what his role is going to be in Atlanta, but they're they're taking a flyer on him, and and we wish him the best. You know, just don't score your touchdowns against Tampa Bay. I Desmond Ritter to Scotty Miller. 75 yard touchdown against Tampa is something that's going to happen. Book Maybe it. that very well might happen. Book it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. So now I, I know, uh, like you said, fans aren't, aren't going to be, you know, crying or, or burning jerseys or anything like that. Uh, but it's, it's a little disappointing to see him go. A lot of fond memories of Scotty Miller in his time in Tampa. He's always going to be a fan favorite, uh, especially for that, for that NFC championship game. He, uh, he was a lot of fun. Absolutely. A lot of fun. Just like this episode has been, but our time has come. We will bid no. you all, uh, do thank you all for making locked on bucks. Your first listen or view every single day. Now make your second listen to Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes from free agency to the draft salary cap management and more join NFL experts, Kyle. Crabs and Joe Marino as they take you through what it's like to build a successful NFL franchise every Monday through Friday. Find Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. We will be back with another episode tomorrow. If you have questions, thoughts, concerns, reactions, of course, send those in to the email LockedOnBucksPodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at Locked On Bucks in the DMs. Those are always open. Check out everything that Evan is doing over on 10 Tampa Bay and at 10 Tampa Bay.com. Check out my work over at BucksNation.com. And of course, follow everything on Twitter at Locked On Bucks, at JRCO underscore Bucks, and at Ekloski WTSP. Hope you all have an absolutely outstanding day. Stay safe, stay healthy, fire the cannons. We thank you so much for joining us right here on Locked on Bucks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.